So today, today you have the pleasure of having Duffy van Ermond, more or less, okay? Okay, good. <laughs> and she's going to talk uh, about gauge symmetries and a new perspective on the Higgs mechanism in this uh, series of lectures, postdocs on the spot. So feel free, please, to, to make questions, interrupt and make questions, and, um, and enjoy it. Okay, so hi everyone, and uh, thanks for this opportunity to, to talk uh, about my work. And when George uh, asked me to give this colloquium, he said, uh, make it in such a way that the students can ask questions. So that's really my goal with which I made this, this, uh, this presentation. And to make it accessible, I will also accept questions in the sense of, I don't understand, or what the hell are you saying? So please feel free to interrupt and and ask questions so we can have a conversation. So I will talk today about symmetries, gauge symmetries, and a new perspective on the Higgs mechanism. So I will start, I will start with a short introduction on, on symmetries in nature, symmetries in physics, and then especially on symmetries in my, uh, in my field of work, which is quantum field theory. And in uh, particularly, I will talk about uh, a special symmetry, which is called gauge symmetries, and uh, a phenomenon that which is uh, known as spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking in field theory. Then I will discuss the, the textbook Higgs mechanism, which all of you will have encountered at some point in your studies. And I will discuss some ambiguities in this model. And then I will discuss the proposal of a Higgs mechanism without symmetry breaking, which also contains some of my own work, and I will end with a conclusion. Yeah, sorry. So, of course, e we see symmetry all around us. We see very beautiful examples of symmetry in nature, in animals, in plants, in uh, snowflakes. And for the layman, uh, we would say that re uh, symmetry refers to a sense of harmony, uh, beautiful proportion, balance, but of course for a physicist this is way too romantic and way too much feeling, so we want a more concrete um, uh, definition. And more concretely we can say that symmetries apply to objects that are invariant under some type of transformation. So if we look at these pictures, we see here three kinds of symmetries. Here we see for the peacock and the butterfly, we see a reflection symmetry, so we can make a reflection and have the same picture. These three pictures have a rotational symmetry, so we can rotate even though with different angles for the three pictures and uh, obtain the same picture. And this vegetable here, uh, which I forgot the name, has uh, what's called a fractal symmetry, which means that if we zoom in, we see the same picture. So this vegetable contains little versions of itself, which contains little versions of itself. And this, of course, plays a role in conformal uh, field theories, these fractal symmetries. Now also, oh, it's not really, OK. So also, the laws of physics show remarkable symmetries, which is beautifully seen, for example, in Maxwell's equations in free space. So if we do not include a, a, a electric uh, monopole or electric source, we see that the Maxwell equations have this symmetry under the exchange of the electric and uh, magnetic field. If we exchange E to B, we will still have the exact same set of equations. Well, at least this is an approximate symmetry because in our world, of course, we do have electric sources and electric currents, which break these symmetries. And this is also a nice example of how symmetries kind of stimulate research, because, because of this breaking of the symmetry, it's always been thought that there should be some magnetic monopole and a magnetic source to uh, make up for this symmetry breaking here. So in a way, symmetries is always stimulating research. Now, the laws of nature are tightly connected to symmetries, and this was nicely put by Amy Noether in her first theorem, where she said that every continuous symmetry of the action of a physical system 
with, uh, with conservative forces has a corresponding conservation law. So let's see what that means in, a, in a, an example. So <coughs> here I put a very simple example of a mass M which, go, which goes with uh, a certain velocity, V or X dot, on a one-dimensional path. Now this whole system is only described by the mass and its velocity. So if we pick up the mass and put it on another point in space, we will still have the exact same system. This is what's called translational symmetry. This is not, this not appeal to our sense of beauty or balance, but it's an important, very important symmetry in physics. And under this translational symmetry, in, in terms of Lagrangian and, and, and action, we say that both of these systems, where we take x to some value of x plus a, plus some, some value, we say that both systems are described by the same Lagrangian. So this Lagrangian, which just entails the kinetic energy, describes both of these systems. Or we can say that the Lagrangian is invariant under uh, translational uh, under a translation. If we now take the action and take the least action principle, and we'll not work out all the details, but if we and we use this part here, we can say that this uh, this uh, symmetry is exactly equivalent to this statement here. If we minimize this part here, we will get this to this conclusion here, which is the famous physical. Uh, classical physics law of conservation of momentum. So, with a little bit of exaggeration, we can say that laws of physics and symmetries are two ways to describe nature. And this is actually at the heart of modern quantum field theory. Because in modern quantum field theory, symmetries take a central role in the formulation of the action. So the modern approach, which is also called Landau, Gin can call Landau Ginsberg approach, is the following. We decide first on the desired symmetries that we want to respect in our model. We formulate the fields, which in quantum field theory are the particles, are representing the particles. We formulate how they transform under the symmetry. And finally, we write down the most general action respecting these symmetries. And in this way, we can describe the standard model with quantum field theory. So I will give the most easy example of, the, of part of the standard model, which is, of course, quantum electrodynamics, which describes photons and electrons. So here we see the action that's formulated. In the action, we see the fields, which here are these A fields, which are the photons. And here we see the psi fields, which are the fermions, which are the electrons. We see dynamics for the photons. We see interaction from this A between the photons and the fermions. And we see a mass term for the fermions. This is the most general action that we can write down respecting the symmetries that we decide upon. And which are, what are these symmetries? So, Obviously, we want Lorentz symmetry. Well, unless you want to break Lorentz symmetry, but this is a complete different story. Let's respect for now Lorentz symmetry. So we can immediately see that this action is, has a Lorentz symmetry because it only has Lorentz scalars. These are indeed vectors, but you can see that they are all um, summed upon. So in the end, you will get a Lorentz scalar, which is Lorentz invariant. Maxwell symmetry is also present. So the E and the B field are here represented by the temporal part of the uh, field strength and the, um, the spatial part of the field strength. And we can uh, interchange them and still get the same action. So the action is invariant under this Maxwell symmetry. Ah, so, yeah, yeah, it's, sorry, you're absolutely right. I, I always, so E should go to B. Wait, I, I can. You're right. So E should go to B, and B should go to min minus E. Yes. So indeed, this is too simple, but. Uh, 
sorry? You don't change the equations of motion, but you change the sign of the action. Um, well, they shouldn't. Uh, and maybe this is because they are anti-symmetric field strengths. That, they, that this would, uh, but this should not be the case. This symmetry should be inside the action. But we can work it out and see if this violates this. Uh, the symmetry. Anyway, this this there, there there should be this this original Maxwell symmetry between the E field field and the B field. Then there is three three symmetries which are called uh, charge conjugation, parity, and time reversal. I will not go into them each uh, each separately, but together they play uh, so, so simultaneously they play an important role, and together they would give that the Lagrangian of x goes to the Lagrangian of minus x. And this, you can see that if this is your Lagrangian, this wouldn't matter because you have this integral over x. So you can, uh, this integral over x will uh, make the, the integral over L of x and L of minus x the same action. So this is also uh, a symmetry of your, of your model. Then there is a global U1 symmetry. So U1 is just, in this case, is just a number with norm 1. For, phi, uh, for psi, so the, the fermion field going to U times psi. And as I said, for every symmetry, there is a conserved uh, uh, law, and there's a conserved object. And a conserved object, in this case, is the electric current. I still am confused. So, psi has an electric charge. No, the 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 the, the conserved current is the is. No, no, no the I'm asking. Does psi have an electric charge? Is psi charged? Yes. So when you change e and b, what happens to that charge? Well, nothing, because the, this is that that's inside this. This no, part here. A, a mu. A mu appears in the covariant derivative. What, what do you do with A mu when you change E to B? A mu is the gauge field, right? Yes. So how does it transform when you change E to B? It's some non-local transformation. Uh, good question. Shouldn't the Maxwell symmetry only apply to that mu? I think so too. Is to add that other part, there's no Maxwell symmetry anymore. Yeah, I think that's the matter, right. The matter part. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, you, so, so the, the symmetry charges. is is inside these f's and not does not yeah, go pure, pure to. Okay. Yeah. Good point. All right. So, so these are are, are some of the the, the symmetries of uh, of this action, and. There's one very large symmetry group that I haven't mentioned yet, and it has a very special status in this, in this theory. It has a large local symmetry under this transformation here, which also where u is also a u1, uh, inside the u1 group. But now this theta, which before was just a number, now de can depend on x. So it can be different on every point in space time. And this transformation, with with x def different at any point in space time, will leave this action also invariant. This is what we call a local gauge transformation. It's not the same as the physical symmetries that I showed you before. A physical symmetry is I take a field, I make some physical changes to this field, I transform it into another field, and I see that my system, in this case the action, is still the same after I make this transformation. For example, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the case of parity, I change my uh, parity and, and time translation. I change my x to minus x. I have two fields, one at x and one at minus x. But both give the same exact action. 
In the case of a, uh, of a gauge transformation, this is completely different because this A and its transformed version are the exact same physical field. I can never measure a difference between A and its gauge transformation. So they are two representations of the same exact physical field. So rather than a symmetry, the gauge symmetry is a redundancy in our model. We are putting a lot of fields which look different from this perspective, but actually re represent the exact same field inside our model. And indeed, if we want to do quantum field theory, we need to somehow restrict these copies. So we need to, of all these representations, we need to find one uh, re representation to represent all the copies that I can make here. So there's a lot to say about gauge symmetry and a lot to think about what it actually means. But for now, I think the most important thing is that it's distinct from physical symmetries, but actually a redundancy in our model. So I now made this symmetry analysis for QED, and we could do a similar, uh, similarly, similar analysis for the actions of the other two interactions in the standard model, which are the weak and the strong interactions. Their actions look a lot like the QED actions, and they're actually based on the ideas of the QED actions. We still have bosons, which are either the W and Z bosons, or the gluons in QCD, and we also have the fermionic part, which are the quarks in both these theories. They will have the same, uh, uh, the same symmetries as I showed you before, well, not the Maxwell symmetries, but also CPT and Lorentz, plus some extra approximate uh, symmetries related to quark flavors, because we now we have different kind of quarks, different flavors of quark, and also color charges, which as play a role in QCD. They also each have their own local gauge symmetry or local gauge redundancy. We have an SU2 for electroweak, so the SU2 group for uh, electroweak, and the local SU3 group for uh, QCD for the strong interaction. Now we see, I said that we see symmetry all around us, but of course, we also see that our universe is not completely symmetric. We, have, we see everywhere examples of a uh, broken symmetry. Look at the chair, for example. Even though the atoms inside the chair will respect a lot of the symmetry laws, we can just see by the shape of the chair that this breaks Lorentz invariance because of its formation within space-time. In field theory, we also uh, want to implement this notion of, of broken symmetries. And there is a, a very important concept, which is called spontaneous symmetry breaking. And formally, this means that the ground state of a system exhibits less symmetry than the system itself. So I will give a few examples to explain what I mean, my mean by this definition. So the first example is a very simple model which is called, it's a classical model, and it's called the Ising model. So in the Ising model, we only have spins. So we have a set of spins, which are either up or down. We can have different kind of configurations. We can have configurations where they're all randomly up or down. We can have a configuration where they're all up or all down. And now we are happy with our more concrete um, uh, with our more concrete definition, because maybe this would appeal more to your idea of beauty or balance, but this is actually the symmetric state. Because if we zoom out enough, if we have enough particles, we can make a transformation, we can flip the whole system, and we will still have the same system, because of this chaos here. So this is the symmetric part. These two are two symmetry breaking, two broken symmetry states. Now, what you should know about the, the Ising model is that it's energetically uh, favorable for each spin to have the same alignment as its neighbor. So it wants to, to, to reduce energy. It wants to have the same alignment as its neighbor. If its neighbor is up, it wants to be up as well. At high temperatures, high energies, this doesn't matter because there's enough energy for them to have their random alignment. So it will 
the easing model in high temperatures will look like this. But now if we lower the temperature and we go to low energy uh, states, they will go into one of the ground states, which is the, uh, one of the states which has the least energy. So either they're all up or they're all down. Now both of them have the same energy. So it doesn't matter for the system whether it goes all up or, low, or all down. But still, if we go to low temperatures, it will choose one of these configurations. Moreover, once it is in one of these configurations at the low energy, at low temperatures, it will be impossible at the same energy to flip from one state to another because this will cost an infinite amount of energy, which is not available. So we say that if we go to low energies, the ground state will, ha will have the symmetry broken because it will choose one of the configurations, one of the symmetry breaking configurations, and it will be stuck in this configuration. It cannot switch from, even though they're both low in energy, to go from one to the other, it would have to overcome some barrier. So it will be stuck in one of the configuration and the symmetry between up and down is lost. So here, uh, uh, another example of spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, uh, from, um, from quantum field theory. So in quantum field theory, we can make a very simple example uh, where the ground state has less symmetry than the system itself. So let's look at a, uh, at a very simple Lagrangian with a phi, um, with uh, just a scalar field, which has one kind of symmetry, which is the reflection symmetry of phi going to minus itself. So the Lagrangian can be written like this. There can be more terms, but this is the important term which is called the potential. So here we see that the potential uh, is symmetric under this, this uh, transformation, and we see that, that we get some potential well here that you probably have seen before. Now in the ground state, so let's put a particle here. In the ground state, so the lowest energy state, which in quantum field theory is called the vacuum expectation value for the field, in the ground state, this field will choose either to be either plus or minus v. It doesn't matter. Both of them will, uh, uh, will uh, get to the least energy. Both of them are okay to get to the least energy. But once the particle has chosen one or has randomly as been assigned to one, it will be impossible for him to go without energy, uh, without an impulse of energy to go from one state to the other. So we see that here the symmetry is spontaneously broken because of the ground state of this particle. Now you can say, okay, but I remember from quantum mechanics that we can do tunneling. This particle can tunnel to the other side and we still have this symmetry from going to one point to the other. But this is where quantum field theory differs fundamentally from quantum theory. Because in quantum theory, we can indeed have this tunneling. There is a, a small energy barrier, but this is doable, and this part, uh, particle can indeed tunnel to the other side. But in quantum field theory, we have an action which integrates over all points in space-time. So even though at one point in space-time this tunneling can take place, we have to do this infinitely many times because we have an infinite volume. At every point in space-time, we would have to do this. And this would, uh, integrating over this, this tunneling barrier would then give still an infinite amount of energy to go from one state to the other. So in, 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 in quantum field theory, opposed from quantum mechanics, we really have spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. You can always also see from this picture very well that spontaneous symmetry breaking is always connected to mass generation. Because here you can see that for this particle to climb up here, it would have to use energy. And if you have to use energy to get uh, moving, this, is, this you can interpret as you have a mass. Because if you wouldn't have a mass, you wouldn't need energy to move. Now these two examples that I gave of the easing model and uh, the example I just gave are all non-discrete uh, symmetries, 
But the same can be applied for discrete symmetry. So here we see the famous Mexican hat potential. This is an, what we call an O2 symmetry. And if we have a discrete symmetry, we, also, we always have massless modes. So we have massive modes. Indeed, it costs energy to go up here, but there's also massless modes in which directions in which it doesn't cost any energy. And Goldstone's theorem says then, so Goldstone found that for every broken generator, so each group comes with a set of generators, if the, if the, the group symmetry is broken, for every broken generator, we get one massless boson, which is called Goldstone bosons. Sorry. What? Sorry, sorry, continuous symmetry. Thank you. Yes. So, indeed, uh, the, the, the two examples that I showed were discrete symmetries, so where I can do it uh, uh, a fixed amount of times before I get back to, to, to my uh, first uh, configuration. And now I have a continuous symmetry, which can be part can be divided in infinitely many parts. So okay. Oh. Yeah. So probably the most uh, famous example from the standard model of uh, uh, symmetry breaking is that of chiral symmetry breaking. So I'm trying. I'm going to try to explain it in very rough steps. So, in, so the basic idea is that in QCD we can divide massless fermions. Okay, we do not have massless fermions in QCD. That's the problem with real-world examples. They are always approximations. But we do have two uh, two quarks which are very very light. So. Uh, so we can take a massless uh, a fermion uh, composed of these very light light quarks, and we can divide these uh, the the terms of these these mass of these massless fermions in left and right-handed fields that do not mix. So we have a left-handed field here and a right-handed field here, and they these terms here can contain other fields, but they do not contain any mixing between these fields. <coughs> now, beautiful, if we have these, these separated, it means that we can transform each of these terms here in their own way. We do not, have, we do not need that the transformation of these, so we have a, an SU2 group for this, this fermion here, which contains an up and a down quark. We do not need that the transformation of this term is the same as this transformation here, because they are separated. So we have a very large symmetry. We have a symmetry for the left-handed uh, fermions and a symmetry for the right-handed fermions. However, we do not observe any behavior according to chirality. We do not observe, when we look at hadrons, we do not observe that they have any, make any difference between being right-handed or left-handed. So we do not expect exactly this symmetry to be there. What we do see is an SU2 isospin symmetry uh, related to the isospin of the, of, of the, 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 the uh, hadrons. So we don't see an SU2 times SU2 uh, symmetry. We see just one SU2 symmetry. So following the idea of the, the spontaneous symmetry breaking, we then expect that the, at low energies, there is some ground state of vacuum expectation value which breaks this symmetry. So this symmetry, which is present at the level of the action, could be broken at the low, at the low energies if we could just make uh, a vacuum expectation value, a non-zero vacuum expectation value, out of the left-handed and right-handed fermions. Because if we make an SU2 times SU2 transformation here, this is not invariant. It's only invariant if they are indeed the same, if it doesn't, if it doesn't matter if we are left-handed or right-handed. So we say that this ground state breaks spontaneously this SU2 times SU2 symmetry to just one SU2 symmetry, which is indeed what we observe. 
also notice that this uh, object here does not break the other symmetries. As we, we, we don't want this bre symmetry breaking to accidentally break other symmetries that we do not expect to be broken. So Lorentz symmetry is still present and also the gauge symmetry of QCD. So the SU3, SU3 gauge symmetry is also still present in this formulation. Now, every broken generator gives uh, a Goldstone mode. So we have a broken SU2. So this is three generators. So we find three Goldstone bosons. And this dovetails perfectly with the three pions that are present, which are not completely massless as Goldstone should be, but also these are not completely massless. So this is one example of um, uh, symmetry breaking in, in, in the uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking in the standard model. Yeah. Okay, so in summary, spontaneous symmetry breaking means that the system gets stuck in some kind of configuration at low energies, while at high energies this, uh, uh, it could move around its symmetry um, freely. So at high energies we expect certain symmetries to be restored. For example, chiral symmetry, we expect that there is some energy level at which this symmetry is, is restored. And if we think about the early universe, we see this as a big ball of energy where uh, energy levels were much higher and that's why we expect that the early universe was much more symmetric than our world here. So we can see our world as a sort of spontaneously broken symmetry of this uh, early universe super symmetric ball. Well, super symmetric I now say in the sense of very symmetric but this is actually where the idea of supersymmetry comes from the idea that uh, at the universe there were symmetries that we do not observe in our world, for example, a symmetry between fermions and bosons. This idea did not take a lot of wings in the recent years because in our laboratory uh, early universe at CERN we do not observe any, any sign of this symmetry. But this idea comes from, from this uh, spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking. So I'm almost coming now to, 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 the, to the idea of the Higgs because I, I, I talked about gauge symmetry, I talked about spontaneous symmetry breaking and this comes together in this, in this Higgs uh, mechanism. So in the 1960s people were looking for a way to describe the WZ bosons of the weak interaction. But the WZ bosons, uh, W and Z bosons were acting very differently from the photons uh, which I showed you in QED, in the sense that they were observed to have a mass. Now we cannot just go back to the action and write a mass for this, uh, this boson, because we know, respecting the symmetries that we formulated, that we cannot just put a mass term for, for a boson. So, we, so people were trying to find a way to introduce this mass into the action without putting by hand a mass term. Now I showed you that uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking is always connected to mass generation. So it's not surprising that many people thought of this idea. What if we have spontaneous symmetry breaking of some, uh, of some symmetry and this generates the mass for the gauge bosons that we, that we are looking for? But there's two questions to be answered. First of all, what is the symmetry that should be broken? And the second question is, Okay, we know that every uh, broken symmetry leads to Goldstone bosons, but there were no, no Goldstone bosons available in the sense that we had these pions available to explain chiral symmetry breaking. There was not, not such modes expected. These two questions were answered at once when Higgs and a lot of his contemporaries came up with the Higgs model. So in the Higgs model, <coughs> there is a... Uh, uh, a, a section um, added to, to the standard model which contains scalar fields which are called Higgs fields. These Higgs fields get some dynamics and they get some 
interactions both with the electro uh, with the um, weak interaction and also with the u1 interaction so this is within the su2 times u1 part of the standard model and the most important part is this um, potential here which i uh, which looks a lot like the one i showed you before with the two uh, with the two wells and this is completely symmetric under all the symmetries that we have uh, uh, formulated. So SU2, U1, and all the other symmetries that we have seen before. And we see that the potential is minimized by this uh, vacuum expectation value here. And we then say, in the usual sense, OK, this spontaneously break with symmetry the local gauge symmetry. So we say that the local gauge symmetry, the SU2 and U1 group, are broken not to zero, but to some other group. So there's some rest uh, symmetry under which this is invariant. So you can just take this phi, make it a gauge transformation, and see that it's not invariant under any transformation of these two, except for this electromagnetics um, uh, transformation. So the first answer to the qu first question is then, which symmetry is broken? The local gauge symmetry. Then the next step would be to expand phi around its symmetry breaking values. You introduce a field to represent the Higgs field, and you have to introduce Goldstone modes. And if you do that, you will get a mass term for your W bosons, which is what you, were like, uh, what you were after. So we will get, without putting it by hand, but some spontaneous breaking of the symmetry, you will get a mass term for your W bosons and Z bosons. So the answer to the first question was, the symmetry that's broken is the local gauge symmetry. The second question was, what about the Goldstone modes? And this answer of the first question answers the second question because if the symmetry that's broken is a local gauge symmetry, the Goldstone modes are not real particles. They are what's called would-be Goldstone modes. And they can easily be, easily be gauged away or eaten up, as they say. We can just make a redefinition of our, of our gauge boson, some gauge transformation. As I said, gauge transformations are not physical transformations. So W and its gauge transformation represent the same field, so we can make this gauge transformation. And you can see that the Goldstone modes will fall out of the action, so they do not represent any physical particle. So this was a great triumph of, of, of the electroweak model and uh, formulated in the 60s, but already very soon, so in 1975, there was, was some, um, some ambig ambiguities were pointed out. Uh, and one of the uh, most important ones was that Elitzer showed that a local symmetry can never be broken spontaneously. So I showed you three examples of a spontaneous symmetry breaking, and all of them were global symmetries. And this is not for nothing, because what we need for a global symmetry to break, or for a symmetry to break, is the notion of an infinite space. Look, for example, at this, uh, uh, this uh, O1 um, uh, symmetry, continuous symmetry again. You can say, OK, I, it doesn't, I can just move this one here, and why is my symmetry broken? Well, this is, again, because of this that in quantum field theory, we have to think about infinite volume. So at every point in space-time, if we want to break the symmetry, we have to do it every point in space-time. So even though our, the energy it costs to move this ball, this particle here, if we have to do it infinitely many times, this will still be an energy barrier. So the energy barrier always goes together with the idea of an infinite volume. So in conclusion, there is, for a, local, for a global symmetry, there is an energy barrier between the ground states. And this is why there's no uh, global uh, transformation possible, because our state would have to overcome this energy barrier. 
However, for a local symmetry, there is no energy barrier, because in a local symmetry, we can never have the notion of an infinite volume. If we would have an infinite volume, it would be a, a global symmetry. So a, a local symmetry is always, per definition, something that happens not in an infinite volume. So any two ground states that are uh, connected by local symmetry can be always accessed by small local transformations. And in the case of a local gauge symmetry, this means that phi can always move around the gauge orbit, averaging to zero. So in Elitzer's theorem, uh, we can also be stated as that all gauge non-invariant operators, which this is a gauge non-invariant operator, must have a vanishing VEF. Yes? Can I make a comment? So that's, that's the part that gets me confused. Okay. Right? So I understand that if you have an infinite system, right? Yes. With only a global symmetry, you have trouble going from one ground state to another ground state because you would have to fluctuate. Just think of a sea of spins, mm -hmm. right? You would have to fluctuate every spin in the same direction at the same time. Yes. And, and that's highly improbable. Yes. Right? If there is a local symmetry, and here I insist a local symmetry, not a local gauge symmetry. Yes. A real local symmetry. Like if I'm thinking of a system of particles that have no spin. So I can rotate one of the particles without changing the system. I don't have to rotate them all, right? I can rotate just one of them and, and nobody feels anything. That's a system with a real local symmetry. Well, why, why is that a local symmetry? Because I can rotate any of these particles and since they have no spin, the system you mean the symmetry is only at this local point? At local point. Okay. I can change one local point physically. I can actually physically yes. rotate okay. a, a small billiard ball. Yes. It has no, no spin. Nobody yes. feels anything. Exactly. That's a real local symmetry. Yes. So that one would never get stuck into any broken symmetry state yes. because I can do it individually. Yes. But now you make the jump to a local gauge symmetry, which you yourself insisted at the start. There is no, not a symmetry, really, just a redundancy on the, or description yes. of the system. So the transformation needed to go from one ground state to another is no real transformation. It's still in the same state, right? If it's broken, it continues to be broken because a gauge symmetry is not a symmetry, right? We, we yes. keep insisting on yes. calling it symmetry, but it's not, right? Yes. So uh, I, I don't see the distinction between applying elite source theorem to a local symmetry, a real one, and a gauge local symmetry. They should be different because one is a symmetry and the other one is just a change in coordinates. Right? Uh, I think in a way that's right. I mean, I, I completely agree that uh, a gauge symmetry is not a real symmetry, but in the way that it's treated in, in the, 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 the Higgs mechanism, it is treated as a, uh, as a local symmetry. Yeah, so sort of. I agree that books are very ambiguous about this, but in the end, what you really quantize is the gauge fixed version of these theories, right? You fix gauge and then you quantize. Yes. Right? So after gauge fixing, there's no gauge symmetry anymore. There's only a global symmetry. Yes, but then I, I, I ask... And you're breaking that global symmetry, right? No, that's, that, 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 that I don't agree, because the idea of the, the Higgs mechanism is not that you fix the gauge and then you take what's left of your global symmetry and then break this symmetry. That's not how the Higgs me uh, mechanism works. F for one thing uh, that, that I, I was going to talk about now, so I don't know where to point with this thing, that's a problem. Uh, so... So wh what you are saying, I think, um, has a connection with, with this uh, Cowdy Greenside paper where they looked at remnant global symmetries. So remnant global symmetries are the symmetries that are left after you fix the gauge. But for one thing is that for each gauge fixing, you would get another global symmetry. So what is exactly this global symmetry then that you are breaking. If you choose the unitary gate, for example, there is no global symmetry anymore. So then should you conclude that the unitary gauge cannot have... Uh, but that's why there's no Goldstone bosons, right? In the unitary gauge. Yes, but then 
what what symmetry breaking is there? If no. there's no symmetry breaking, or is there a global symmetry breaking? There's no the symmetry breaking and no goldstones. I mean, the conclusion you get in each of the gauge fixings is different, but they are all equivalent in the end in the number of degrees of freedom and the whole story, right? So if you have a remnant global yes. symmetry, you break that and you have gold, goldstone bosons. If you have no remnant global symmetry, you're not breaking anything, but there's no goldstone bosons. So it, it's all consistent. Right? It, it changes the conclusion in the end, but the actual physical picture, the number of degrees of freedom, yes. and scatterings you would calculate. As I said, right, the gold, goldstone bosons are totally equivalent to the longitudinal modes of the Ws and Zs. Yes. Right? So you're calling things different names, but in the end you have the same uh, physical picture, right? Same phenomenology. Yes, but I think I think uh, we we might uh, be agreeing because I think the, the 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 point that I'm trying to make is that there is no spontaneous symmetry breaking. Yeah, but uh, the point I disagree is not there is no local symmetry breaking. I agree with that, but the point I'm trying to make is because there was no local symmetry to start with. This is this this yes, but there was fields, also no, it's no a, it's just symmetry. redundancies, right? Yes, it's, it's not local symmetry. Okay, Wait, maybe yeah. maybe we can okay. talk about go it ahead, because ahead, I, I, I I want to to come to so I will. These are some other ideas about ambiguities of the Higgs model, but I want to use the rest of of the time just to 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 get to the idea that I actually wanted to discuss. So one thing that's important is the Higgs model is hugely successful, especially these two propagators here give the pole masses, so the, 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 the physical masses for both the W and Z bosons and the Higgs bosons. So if we want to make uh, a, a new model or an improved model, we would have to somehow keep the masses of these, uh, these um, propagators around. So I will skip this. So this is the, the most important point that I, I wanted to make is that so we have we want uh, a few things. We want um, uh, we want to keep the good things of the Higgs mechanism but we also don't want to violate Elitzer's theory. We don't want to uh, break uh, uh, the local gauge symmetry. So, at Hoft and later uh, FMS found that the Higgs model provides actually a natural way to do this. They found a natural way to formulate gauge invariant extensions of the elementary fields, which are all built up from the elementary fields itself and Higgs, uh, Higgs fields. And they are all gauge invariant. And they are all constructed in such a way that for a constant value of the Higgs field, we regain each elementary field that it's supposed to represent. And now we can have a, a non-zero uh, vacuum expectation value without violating Elitzer's theorem, because this is a gauge invariant object, so we do not break gauge invariants. And uh, Elitzer's theorem only said things about gauge invariant objects, uh, gauge variant objects, and this gauge invariant object can very well have a non-zero VEF. And now comes the idea of the Higgs mechanism without symmetry breaking, so without breaking the symmetry, instead of taking uh, phi around, its, around V, so saying that phi has a VEF, a symmetry breaking VEF, and then defining a new action, what we do is we formulate the propagator of this gauge invariant object, and we may take the same expansion inside this gauge invariant object. And then we get a series of elementary propagators uh, that each by themselves might not be gauge invariant, but the sum of them should be gauge invariant because they come from this gauge invariant object. One important point is that it was found on the lattice, and you can also kind of guess it from this, unless something very weird happens here, is that these two have the same pole. They have the same pole mass. So one thing that, that I emphasized was important that we keep the pole mass of this object here, which is the experimentally verified pole mass, and this is indeed kept even if we work with these new uh, gauge invariant objects here. Another point I want to say is that this is something that we 
always looking for in, in quantum field theory. Because these objects are the most accessible in loop calculations or whatever uh, um, method you are using, these elementary things here. But of course, they are not gauge invariant, so they cannot represent physics. So we are always looking for ways to describe this. But these are not so accessible in, in, in our methods. So now we have so this, this uh, FMS mechanism or this Higgs mechanism without symmetry breaking provides just that. So we can work with the elementary uh, propagators. And at the same time, because we, uh, we um, take into account this whole sum, we can work uh, with gauge invariant objects. So a little bit about my work. What we did is we looked at the spectral density function. So this is something else you can look at besides the pole mass. The spectral density function tells you uh, the physical decays of your propagator as your particle goes from point, a, uh, from point X to point Y. And we formulated the same idea of at Hoft and FMS in uh, U1 uh, gauge theory with this, um, with this uh, expansion here. We have this sum here which uh, start with the elementary uh, propagators. And what we did is we looked at the spectral density functions for for both the elementary part and the uh, uh, the um, gauge invariant part so here you see highly non physical behavior for the elementary higgs um, propagator one thing you see is that there's a dependence on the gauge parameter so it's gauge dependent it's different for each uh, gauge fixing and you also see a violation of positivity, which does not represent a, a physical particle. If we do the same thing, a spectral function, so this is all up to, to one loop order. So if we make a, a spectral function for its gauge invariant extension, we see a, a, a spectral density function which can very well represent a, a physical particle. So we did the same for the SU2 part and also for the gauge boson in SU2. So you see roughly the same picture. So to have some time for questions, I will just tell you my conclusions. Um, go. So my conclusions are, uh, well, the Higgs model provides uh, a way to employ the Higgs mechanism without the, uh, the idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking um, and obtains the same results that were so powerful from, from the, the original formulation. Um, gauge invariant composite operators can be employed to access the physical spectrum for a gauge Higgs theories. So these are these spectral density functions that I showed you. The elementary operators, so the, the elementary uh, uh, degrees of freedom, they, uh, they show a gauge dependency and sometimes they violate positivity, so they are non-physical. Well, if we do the same thing, so we look at the spectral properties of the Higgs model, they do not show any unphysical behavior when we analyze them through these gauge invariant extensions. So uh, yeah, that's, that, that, that's my conclusion, that these gauge invariant extensions can uh, provide physical results uh, in, in, in a broader sense than the, the original Higgs formulation can, while also um, solving some theoretical inconsistencies of the Higgs model. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? So the action is non-local when you try to write it in terms of the gauge invariant quantities, right? You can't write an well, action in terms uh, well of gauge invariant quantities. Well, it's not actually necessary to rewrite the action at all. 
I understand, but eventually you want to compute these propagators, right? Yes, but what... How are you going to compute? So, so what, you, what, you, what you do is... Uh, right. So, so what you do, for example, here, if you have a, a U1 Higgs model, is that you take this expansion as you would normally do expanding your action into, into your new degrees of freedom, so having your action in terms of, of H and, and, and V, you now do this at this level and you get some uh, sum of, uh, of uh, so here you would have H, H, I but understand. you could also yeah. have H, 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 mm -hmm. and you can calculate them in the usual way with the, uh, with the broken right. action. Yeah, so you gauge, fix, you compute, and then you try to write the answer in a gauge invariant way. Is that yes, okay. yes. Okay. But the action lo looks the I same. Understand. Yes. Thanks. Uh, so in the standard model, the whole motivation in the th from the theoretical perspective to introduce the Higgs mechanism is that we do not introduce uh, by hand a mass term for the W and Z bosons. Yes. Right? Yes. Because if you do that, you break gauge invariance. But why yes. do we need gauge invariance in the first place? That's a very good question. And I think there can be uh, lots of answers and discussions about that. Uh, the, the, the if, you would, if you would go to an action and say, OK, I just throw away my gauge invariance because it means nothing, you're kind of lost because you build your, your action around this, this gauge invariance. For example, if, if uh, you, can, you can put some, some gauge breaking symmetries, you can not show renormalizability of, of your model. And, yeah, and it's, it's not even unitary. If you, if you, you can't try to spin one kinetic term without gauge symmetry. If you knew, there, there is no, you understand what I'm saying, right? Well, you can write it. I mean, it's not forbidden to have gauge symmetric mm. things if you break. I, I, I don't understand your, your point. You have to have two degrees of freedom of a massless spin one. If you have three degrees of freedom, it's not, it's not massless. Ah, OK, yeah. That's, that's a good answer. Another answer that I wanted to, to say uh, that I didn't have time to go into is what's called BRS symmetry. I don't know if you heard about this. So. Indeed, we fix the gauge, so we kind of throw away our gauge invariance. And because after fixing a gauge, our model is not gauge invariant anymore. But you can see that there's uh, a, a, a global uh, symmetry which looks a lot like the gauge symmetry, which is still there, which is called the BRSD symmetry. And this BRSD symmetry is important for uh, defining the physical space. You can distinguish between physical and non-physical uh, degrees of freedom, for example, ghosts, which are unphysical, are, are, are uh, so, so the BRST symmetry for me is really what's behind the idea of keeping the gauge symmetry. And that's for proving unitarity of the theory, right? That's for? Proving the unitarity of the theory? Yes. Okay. Uh, something that confused me about the end of the presentation is yes. you seemed to imply that the Higgs 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 uh, correlation function, so the propagator is gauge invariant, gauge, uh, not gauge invariant or something uh, like that. This one? Uh, the H of X, H of Y, yes. Yeah, uh, no, it's not gauge invariant. It's not? It's not gauge invariant. No, you can see this here uh, simply by by seeing that for different uh, different uh, values of the gauge parameter, you get a different spectral density function. So it's not a, it's not a gauge invariant object. Is there any other place in the standard model where? Uh, if you compute a correlator like that, it's not going to be a gauge invariant thing? All of them, yes. All of them? <laughs> exactly, all of them. OK. Unless you do some uh, Wilson line or you do some, so that's what I, I was saying. Uh, what people are looking for is a way to, to, to write it gauge invariantly. But in principle, putting fields like this, even though this is the most, uh, so, uh, most 
researched object, they are not gate invariant. Okay. Except one exception is the transverse photon. Transverse photon, photon is really gate invariant. So, thank you. Yeah. Other questions? So we thank again Dwifi for for this nice colloquium.